I'm Lucas Mampai, Managing Director of the World Association of Nuclear Operators. The impact of the accident at Chernobyl awakened the international community to the need for high standards and the exchange of information in order to promote nuclear safety worldwide. In response, the World Association of Nuclear Operators, or WALO, was founded in 1989, uniting over 400 nuclear power plants in over 30 countries. There are important lessons in the Chernobyl accident for workers in the nuclear industry. Many of these lessons are focused on how a nuclear professional should approach risk. The Chernobyl accident highlights mistakes that human beings can make, mistakes those of us in the nuclear industry do not want to repeat. The information I will present to you today is based on an investigation conducted by the Soviet government soon after the accident. A special test was being conducted at Chernobyl Unit 4 to determine how long inertia from a turbine generator as it coasted down would supply electricity to essential equipment in the event of a local power failure. Earlier testing of this sort had been initiated with a trip of the reactor with all of the safety systems in service. In addition, the test had been initiated with the reactor in a stable condition. This test was different. It was to be performed with the reactor operating with the safety system disabled. This was fundamentally flawed. Several other plants had been requested to run the test and they had declined. Normally, tripping turbine generator would trigger an automatic shutdown of the reactor. This test procedure disabled the automatic shutdown so that the test could be repeated if the first attempt was unsuccessful. The automatic start of the emergency core cooling system had also been disabled to prevent interference with the test. This was in violation of operating procedures. The test procedure required that reactor power had to be reduced to between a quarter and a third of full power. The test also required that two additional reactor coolant pumps be started with electrical power from another source. This was done to ensure that the cooling of the reactor was maintained during the coast down of the turbine. Operation of the additional cooling pumps was prohibited by station procedures because the increased flow of water brought the reactor in an unstable condition where a slight rise in power level would cause more steam to be formed in the reactor, resulting in a further escalating increase in reactor power. The Chernobyl reactors were of a significantly different design from those in the United States. In U.S. boiling water reactors, steam formed in the core has the effect of slowing the nuclear chain reaction. At Chernobyl, the formation of steam did not slow the fission reaction, but rather increased it. Additionally, the control rods used in the reactor to adjust power level and to shut down the plant in an emergency actually produce a brief surge in power upon initial insertion. These were the conditions facing the operators when the test began. Why didn't anyone involved in the test challenge it, like personnel at other stations had done? This human side of the accident may be more complex than the technical aspects of reactor operation. The men in authority at a station, the ones driving the test, were not experienced nuclear engineers or operators. Their backgrounds were from other engineering disciplines, they may not have recognized the dangers of this test. Now the test was begun. Conditions were established. Operators began reducing power. However, before the reactor reached test levels, the controller of the local electrical grid requested that the plant remain online to satisfy public power needs. The reactor remained at 50% power for about 10 hours with the safety systems disabled. Extended operation at this unplanned lower power allowed fission products to build up. These inhibited the nuclear chain reaction, causing reactor power to drop further. Operators experienced difficulties keeping reactor power at the desired value, and power levels fell to 1% of full power capacity. 
This jeopardized the test, and the deputy chief engineer for operations chastised the operators for losing control of the plant. The operating crew was directed to raise power and resume the test. There was only one way to raise power. Procedures required that at least 30 control rods be inserted in the core at all times, so that sufficient shutdown capability would be maintained for any accident. Withdrawing these control rods was not an allowed option, but it was the only way to raise power. Unit Shift Chief and the reactor operator accepted the command and began withdrawing control rods. This was a serious violation of operating procedures and a large step outside of the boundaries of the test procedure. Why did they do it? The answer is pressure. The test would have been delayed by one year if not performed at that time. There will always be pressure on people working in industry to get the job done. People that succeed in management are able to apply that pressure to others. Those are basic truths that we must face. Each nuclear professional must recognize those truths and be prepared to stand against them when nuclear or personnel safety is being threatened. These men did not stand against the pressure. The stage was set for disaster. The test was started. The turbine generated close down was initiated. As four of the eight reactor coolant water pumps slowed down and pumped less water, more and more of the reactor water began to boil. The increased boiling caused an increase in reactor power. This produced even more steam and power continued to rise. Operator attempted an emergency shutdown of the reactor. Initial insertion of the control rods caused reactor power to rise further. Powerful vibrations surged through the plant. Violent crashing sounds were heard. The power level in the reactor quickly flashed to more than 100 times the normal full power level. Reactor pressure rose rapidly and blew the 1,000 ton reactor cover plate into the air. The upper portions of the reactor building were destroyed. At least 3% of reactor fuel was expelled into the surrounding area. During the destruction of the reactor, graphite used to help control the nuclear reaction caught fire and was ejected. Several fires resulted on site. Large amounts of radioactive material were released into the surrounding area and dispersed with the wind throughout northern Europe. 30 people died shortly after the accident. 346,000 area residents were evacuated. It is estimated that there may be 4,000 radiation-related cancer deaths because of the accident. To conclude, this is a very sad story. The design was such that the reactor could be made inherently unstable. Reactor safety depended on administrative controls and ultimately on the operators staying away from unstable operating conditions. It is sad to see that several barriers of professionalism were broken at different levels of the organization, leading to a situation where the operators brought the reactor exactly in those conditions where it should not be. Several individuals at different levels could have acted to prevent the accident, yet they did the contrary. They broke one barrier after the other, leading to the Chernobyl disaster that still today has a negative impact on our entire nuclear industry.